Hey everybody, uh, it's me, Omegon again, and uh, I thought I would do this little video on canon, as I was requested to by several people that uh, work with me. Um, I decided to just make it into a mind map to organize it visually, because there's not, you know, I can't just uh, visually organize this with artwork or anything exactly for anyone. Um, so I just, uh, you'll probably just be seeing, uh, like the cropped in mind map that I made of this. Basically, to, to begin, uh, how canon works in 40k in the pre-modern era, not the modern modern era, which I'll get into, was, uh, not very well defined and in specific, and this is basically the guidelines that I've always used that have served me well and served many other people well. Um, so take, you can take this as just my opinion. But uh, I can back up a lot of what I'm saying here, and you'll see. So, canon, uh, essentially it was broken into several tiers. Uh, at least how I did it um, way back when. Tier 0 would be Word of God, word of, like Games Workshop directly saying stuff. Though the issue with this was Games Workshop, as it changed management, as it changed art direction, as it changed its as a, a, their like, you know, more and more their marketing department started meddling with what was lore and what wasn't, it became fairly obvious that uh, they were doing things to sell models, not to, you know, push a story forward. And often, many story points would just get thrown completely under the bus because that was how the, uh, that was just what they wanted. Um, and then after that was Tier 1, I always believed, was the core rule books. Though there is a section here, obviously, defunct canon. There was a lot of things in the pre-modern era that were considered defunct, care, uh, defunct canon. The vast majority of 40K, of 40K's canon falls into the realm of, like, 3rd edition to about 5th, 6th edition. And around the end of 5th edition was when GW started directly messing with a lot of things. Though they had, like, directly done a lot of things earlier, especially with making... 1st and 2nd edition defunct. The 1st and 2nd edition uh, weren't just made defunct because like they, they contradicted with a lot of things prior, but because 1st edition was a mess and 2nd edition was had no organization to it at all. Whereas obviously each edition they've continued to streamline it down and streamline it down and streamline it down and streamlining is usually a bad thing, I believe, and I'm sure many people agree, but that's neither here nor there, because the vast majority of the 40k canon came about as a result of the various RPGs, the codexes, what was written in the core rulebooks, and a lot of the stuff that came out of Black Library, along with comics and video game tie-ins and everything. And all of that stuff went along with the same pattern that started in 3rd edition and uh, onward. So, with that in mind, you have to, you have to understand, it's like, it, the it's ambiguously, like, ambiguously, 3rd edition to 5th edition followed a specific pattern. And then 5th edition, after 5th edition, was when canon started being this stuff over here that nobody cared about. I'm just going to indicate this blank white screen. That was like, it could be anything. It was whatever GW did, wasn't directly focused on, and then what GW said. Um... And uh, I'll explain more as we get to the further tiers. So, Tier 0 was Word of Games Workshop, and then Tier 1 were Core Rulebooks. And then, after that, you would have the Tier 2 were the Codices. And so, if you had lore that came out of the Core Rulebook, and there was lore out of a Codex that uh, contradicted it, most of the time, your best idea was to go with whatever the Core Rulebook's lore said, unless they were from different editions, and then you'd have to use your own judgment. Um... As far as Defunct Canon went, obviously Rogue Trader, 2nd edition. And then Word of Games Workshop, uh, as this mind map unfolds, obviously, showing you. Uh, Word of Games Workshop most of the time came through author and editor opinions that were sanctioned by their marketing team. And that has gotten much more obvious in these days, especially since you can go and look at horrible things like uh, AMAs on Reddit from any of the Black Library authors where... They don't really go into detail, but they do mention offhand very often that uh, marketing teams and whatnot tell them if and what and whatnot to change a lot of the time. And they'll, 
like, especially people like Aronimsky Bowden, they'll be very mealy mouthed with it and they'll act like, no, 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 this doesn't happen. Uh, it's a, this is very rare and blah, blah, blah. But if you read between the lines, it's fairly obvious that like there's a, there's a direction that they have to follow. And that is most obvious in their books because, but you know, the horse heresy is a good example of this where the horse heresy itself, the entirety of the black library production of horse heresy, all of those novels were considered part of tier zero over here because games workshop said, no, this overrides previous canon on it. And not only did that create issues with all the previous information said about it, but, um, it, they didn't really explain if, uh, anything in the hor the Horus Heresy black books, the fluff that Forge World came out with at the same time for the actual, like, war game itself versus the novels had anything to do with one or the other, and those could often be contradictory. So, what often came about was you would have uh, times when the story itself would stop, like, stories in the novels and writing in the novels would stop and take a break to, like, come out and say straight up um, like verbatim titles of models that GW was currently selling. Like, there were previous novels in the Horus Heresy series where Dan Abnett would describe troop carriers and assault ships and he wouldn't have pattern names and he would just say they looked like this, they looked like that, they fat birds coming in, large fat insects birthing young and yada yada to like, you know, describe drop ships dropping tons of troops. And then Several books later, as GW would, like, tighten the grip on that, and they wanted to sell more and more models, suddenly there weren't various different dropships that could fit different descriptions, and, they, and their names and titles weren't important. It was, everything was a Sokar pattern Stormbird that just so happens to be on sale at ForgeWorld.com right now, and .co.uk, and, uh, or whatever, and you had to, you had to, like, you have to parse that kind of information, and there's people out there, I believe, that would be in denial that this is the direction they're taking. But honestly, like, that, that is just how it is. And if you deny otherwise, then you're probably not really looking at the same game as the rest of us are. Because just, there very much is a, a trend to make 40k more and more, like, corporatized, more and more safe, more and more advertiser-friendly. They... GW absolutely wants, you know, something like the Marvel audience or the Disney audience or whatever, and they're not happy with just maintaining the status, uh, maintaining the status quo even, or going back to having the audience that they used to, as you can see with all of their, with like all of the new things that they put out where they, they're they losing fans constantly, and they just don't report any of their numbers on it, so you don't believe so. But it's, that's neither here nor there as far as canon goes. That's just vaguely related to it. So, Tier 1, then Tier 2 is codices. So, if there's things in a codex that uh, contradicts what goes on in a core rulebook, generally speaking, the core rulebook is what you should go by. Though, as rule as time went on, rule book, core rulebooks got more and more specific. And... They would, like, later editions usually contra contradict earlier editions, and they usually do that in the service of pushing an author's agenda or trying to push, uh, you know, trying to push corporate marketing. So when you get a hint of that, you should use your best judgment for what you consider is and isn't canon. After that, um, Tier 2 to Tier 3 is kind of broken down where, the like, Tier 2.5 would be Forge World content. And because Forge World put out Imperial Armor, they put out the Black Books for the Horus Heresy, they put out a lot of things like that, that most of that was all very much, um, all of, like, all of that was all very much, uh, considered more canonical, probably, than many of the Black Library novels, especially because, you know, it, 40k is, a, at heart, it's a tabletop war game, and Forge World was producing content that was primarily for the tabletop war game as opposed to just consumption as a piece of literature or be, you know airport literature or not after that white dwarf which white dwarf falls in the similar lines with that and then after that you would have black library novels and black library is a bit nebulous because they're technically the overpublisher for also comic books but because of how copyright works 
a lot of the Warhammer tie-in comics are of a totally different, uh, like are totally different uh, parent have like totally different designers and parent companies and rules as far as their copyright follows. Such as like a good example of this is the reason why Malal is canon but not really canon in 40k and fantasy is because the uh, the character that Chaos God the character and Caleb Dark and everything those were well Caleb Dark I believe pre-existed it but the book that Malal slash Malice was from uh, was written in a time when GW didn't have a full grasp on the on the differences of copyright law between entertainment mediums i.e. in this case specifically comics and so when they pissed off the writer of the comic because they didn't want to they didn't they demanded that he give them they give he they demanded that he give GW all the rest of his rights because they didn't know how to write their contract for him at the time and he said we'll pay me more royalties and they said no so he walked away with the rights so technically Malal slash Malice is still canon in in GW because they can't actually erase the character because they don't own the copyright to it but at the same time they try to like you know sideline the character as much as possible and the original writer doesn't actually get like give a shit so he's he's not there to um he like there's no cases being made it's just it exists in this limbo of non-canon canon which fits well with the whole fandom speculation that it's the the god of non-existence the chaos god of atheism he doesn't exist but he does shut up about it which is interesting but unfortunately it's something that GW will never expand upon because GW sucks and the majority of the any of the writers that they have including the people that have written the, uh, like any of the lore in the Sons of Malice uh, Renegade Space Marine Chapter slash Chaos Marine Warband uh, most of those guys usually get no like they they usually don't have any uh, airtime at all so to speak but tier three is the black library novels and most of the comic tie-ins that they make but that is nebulous and then after that is so they have their background books similar to xenology which there's they're far less common now you have like comics obviously background books that are far less common now and um they're like far less common now because uh I hate my map sometimes it sucks because the last few times that they made background books they were made by they're very expensive to make because you needed it like you know especially like a book like Xenology which is the gold standard they need that was even though it was mostly one writer it had like it had an entire art team dedicated to it and GW not only hates the writer who made it because like just they've tried to uh, memory hole everything he's ever done but also he um he uh did a lot of things in that book that GW at the time didn't like even though they later on adopted most of the uh canonical changes that he made and or changes quote unquote and at some point I'll probably have to get into the nitty gritty of xenology and how it affected a lot of the lore later on after it but um Tier 2.8 here, I'll say this, that's like close to, it's it's close to being Black Library tier, but it's still like better than it is the, is some of the novels and audio dramas, especially the audio dramas, because the vast majority of the audio dramas that they make, uh, not only do they require a higher production quality, uh, like production quality value, or production value quality, but uh, because they have to actually get voice actors for them, even if their sound design team usually sucks. Uh, vast majority of them that they make are for the Horus Heresy series, which, as I said before, over here with Tier Zero, GW has declared more canon than everybody else's canon because they are desperate uh, to maintain all the money that they're getting out of the Horus Heresy. So, that's that. And then Tier 4 would be Other, which... Well... Other is best uh, indicated as... Like the video games, the independent comics, and uh, the Black Industries, like Black Industries only made Dark Heresy for like the core rulebook before Fantasy Flight Games took over, and the Fantasy Flight Games RPGs. The uh, so the Fantasy Flight Game RPGs are a particular note because even though they're they are four tiers of canon away, 
they have some of the most fleshed out lore on the vast majority of like the real nitty gritty of of 40k that a lot of modern players have gotten into like the uh, you know a lot of the um until the modern Skatari Codex came out, and the modern uh, Cult Mechanicus Codex came out, 6th edition, 7th edition, and then into 8th edition now, which will be about the time that recording this video, the vast majority of information on how the Adeptus Mechanicus operated came from 2nd edition, like 2nd edition 40k, and then what Fantasy Flight Games fluff was on it, aside from a few novels here and there from Black Library, that didn't really get into too much detail for them. And... While Fantasy Flight games themselves were also kind of infected by the Horus Heresy bug, where, you know, suddenly everything in 40k retroactively had to follow patterns that were from 10,000 years prior, because the Horus Heresy was popular and now we need to constantly reference it, um, they still went out on their own and made a lot of stuff that was very fluffy, and they did a lot of stuff very much in line with the writings of Dan Abnett, who, through his Eisenhorn and Ravenor books, fleshed out the vast majority of what it, of like civilian life that like not extremely fleshed out but like in, at least in their own like his own sector and subsectors and like how things were done around uh, Eisenhorn and Ravenor they had a, like those characters they had a lot of details about the civilian life of the imperium and uh fin fantasy flight games to their credit uh even when they had a lot of bad rpg mechanics they had a lot of really, really good fluff. Sometimes there's there's some really like Mary Sue junk, like how they handled the, the Captain Harlock adventures, how they handled like the stuff like the Lathe Worlds and the Lord Dragon, the Lord's Dragon. But they still had a lot of stuff that was very, very good and fleshed out a lot and helped a lot of people get their heads around what it was like to be. Like what what the setting of the 41st millennium is actually like beyond just the battlefields. And for that, they have a like they they do deserve a tremendous amount of credit, despite the fact that GW themselves, especially since their license has run out and has tried to replace them with Wrath and Glory and failed, uh, treats most of the canon that came out of their game uh, like most of the canon that came out of any of the tabletop games and most of that fluff as you know stories and whatnot. And they did the same thing to a lot of the video games, which honestly was a good thing because the vast majority of the video games, especially in the modern era for uh, for 40k, have been complete junk like shovelware that was made because people got to steal a license really quick. But uh, they did that to the Dawn of War games as well. And Dawn of War 1 and 2, while they did like wank the Blood Ravens a lot, they did have a lot of really good fluff on their own. Um, and then independent comics, like I referenced with uh, the comic about uh, Caleb Dark and Malal and Malice and everything, and uh, like especially because like 40K's origin was a bunch of artists from 2000 AD coming to uh, coming to help Rick Priestley uh, like design his game, and it was you know, it was a big joke and it was satirical, much like the original 2000 AD comics were before, you know, everybody started taking Judge Dredd seriously and thought that it wasn't a joke, it wasn't a riff on police states. And, uh, especially because, like, you know, a, a lot of the political commentary of 2000 AD's original runs from the 90s and, like, the 80s and 90s has not aged all that well. But, um, as far as that goes, that's all Tier 4. And then... A lot like how uh, how the canon has gone for each edition is each later edition basically de uh, like basically renders the previous edition defunct as far as GW is concerned, which is honestly a bad thing because the vast majority of what drew everybody in what drew everybody into 40k happened in this time period between third edition, like, between the end of second edition and the beginning of sixth edition was, I wouldn't say the golden age of 40k, but it was, like, the closest they, uh, they got to things starting to be concrete and having specific themes and following patterns that, while like, they were patterns, they wouldn't uh, they, they weren't there just for marketing, like, reasons. There was actually, you know, story reasons to care there. And the problem is, is that 
the transition from 5th edition to 7th edition marked GW treating 40k less as a setting and more as a story when uh, and that is not the that is not what it was supposed to be and I mean most of what 40k was supposed to be in the first place was completely was rendered completely mute uh, like null and void by the Horus Heresy series being fleshed out and uh, that can mostly be laid at the feet of GW's marketing team and their modern writers that have essentially in like in the service of just you know making their own characters and trying to make their own mark on history turn their backs on everything that the setting or like set out to do and or not set out to do but rather was like built upon as in like to to explain like grossly oversimplify it Rick Priestley when he made uh, Rogue Trader said yes he stole everything yes it was all very tongue in cheek and but when he talked about one of the chief influences of the setting was like beyond Doom beyond 2000 AD beyond James Cameron movies beyond 80s action movies he was reading Paradise Lost at the time and he wanted that the he wanted the Emperor and the Imperium of Man and everything to be apropos to Doom or Doom Doom not Doom uh, apropos to Dune and like God Emperor of Dune and Dune Messiah, he wanted it to be a kind of uh, deconstruction of organized religion and satire on organized religion. So, of course, as soon as the Horus Heresy series started coming out in the mid 2000s, the first thing that they did was totally reverse the reverse that and make it so that the setting is actually like the the message of the setting, at least from the Imperial perspective and the the story quote-unquote the story from the imperial perspective is suddenly uh having blind faith in a godlike super being and everything is the only way to survive because we say so and uh organized religion is actually not so bad because if you don't have organized religion demons will shoot out of your nose or something and a lot of people think that that's a foolproof argument and that a lot of the previous canon proves that but that's like that's just like, that's just, you know, moving your goalposts and astroturfing for a new canon that pretty much only exists to justify all the marketing. Because if the horror, like, 40k would be exactly the same as it always was, like, nowadays, if it weren't for the fact that the Horus Heresy suddenly, out of nowhere, became a New York Times bestseller. And the, uh, like, much, to, I believe that's much to its detriment. And worse than that was the Horus Heresy game selling like hotcakes is what led to a lot of the canonical errors and everything else I would say entirely because GW wanted to basically whitewash every like not GW just itself but like the people within GW especially many of the writers wanted to whitewash all the previous stuff back so that they could continue making more money and writing the same writing the characters they liked and started removing anything that contradicted that uh, because the Horus Heresy book series showed them that they can do any, they can write any sort of terrible Mary Sue character as long as they attach it to this grand, ridiculous conflict that everybody is super invested in now. And uh, on, on the uh, model side and the tabletop side, it showed them that they can basically get rid of almost everybody's factions. They can throw chaos under the bus. They can get rid of orcs. Basically, they can they can treat Sisters of Battle like dirt. But uh, it, because everybody just wants to play Marines fighting Marines with special rules only for Marines anyway. And as far as that goes, that's, that's basically the push we've seen is to, like, anything that has contradicted the quote-unquote story that GW and the writers there that bend heel to the marketing team, or bend, bend knee to the marketing team, I should say, not bend heel, uh, goes is constantly removed best example of this is the Ayaterra campaign which I could do a series of videos on by by itself and I, I didn't even play in the Eye of Terror campaign I didn't have personal experience with that but the Eye of Terror campaign was such a legendary goat fuck that like there's still despite the best efforts of most of the editors on any of the wikis that you look up any of the websites that talk about 40k that are run by people that are just trying to astroturf for the company's modern direction now despite all of that you can still find a good amount of information on how badly run the Eye of Terror campaign was. And uh, as as of the recording of this video, we're slowly coming up to 9th edition 40k, which I didn't add in a, a thing here for the Psychic Awakening, which was the next event, but it went 6th edition, 7th edition, Gathering Storm, 
8th edition, uh, Psychic Awakening, and now in the 9th edition, and that's also been kind of a clusterfuck to itself, because, you know, we're 9th edition, it's like less than, less than three years ago, we had, we had 8th edition come out, and Psychic Awakening so far has been all of these things that have turned out next to nothing, like next to no new rules, next to no new models, really, even though it's it's been hinted at and teased as this giant event that's huge and a super big deal. And instead, it's like we, we've gotten most of the new content I've seen for 40K has been... And I, to be fair, I don't really follow a lot of 40K stuff because 8th edition basically ruined my faith in, in the franchise because they, you know... GW, I should have known because GW did the same thing with Fantasy with Age of Sigmar and we're coming on to we're, we are now in a day and age where people are so are have, have been bullied into buying corporate marketing have been bullied into believing astroturfing have been bullied into functionally being stupid so much, like they've functionally been bullied into being stupid, like so much that they actually believe that, you know, Age of Sigmar was not a heinous, terrible betrayal of an entire fan, of like an entire base of a market that was built up over time. And that it wasn't that bad, it wasn't like, it wasn't awful, just just move on, even though we might have rendered several thousand dollars and years and years of experience and time and money you put into the thing. We might have rendered all of that pointless because we wanted to just sell the same, we wanted to sell more space brains to teenagers, but you know, with a fantasy aesthetic instead of a space fantasy aesthetic. No, no, no. Like, it's fine that, like, that. that's not a big deal. Just, just give up, just get over it. Okay, boomer. And, like, now, you know, anybody older, like, anybody who, who doesn't like the modern direction is basically considered a boomer for some reason, even though the vast majority of the 40k fan base these days are Gen Xers. But whatever. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm an old man. My complaints mean nothing obviously, because I don't like the new Skatari, I don't like the new I, I don't like Adeptus Custodes being playable, I don't like every, I don't like Grey Knights, I don't like Space Marine players in general, I must be some kind of, uh, like a boomer fun Nazi and I have no idea what I'm talking about uh rants aside about canon and how canon, canon and the removal thereof has functionally been used as a weapon against the older fan, like older, smarter fans that don't like the changes GW keeps making. Um, there is a, a separate, a, a separate thing to note here, and that there is there's several separate things. As a matter of fact, there's outer text canon sourcing. So, essentially, when you're sourcing anything from the canon. You're going to go to one of three places generally. There's wikis, blogs, and YouTube channels. YouTube channels, uh, I organize them like this. The best to follow, really, are hobby channels because they are interested in the meta of the game, and the meta of the game is very tied to the lore, not because the lore justifies, like, not because, like, the meta is justified by the lore or vice versa generally on a one to one ratio, but because the vast majority of the time, GW will make changes in the lore to justify why suddenly uh, you like suddenly there's things like they did this with knights, they did this with riptides, they did that with space marines. The entirety of the Black Legion, uh, as far as I've seen it, the Black Legion story, short stories, and Black Legion novels by Aaron Nemsky Bowden uh, from G from Black Library have essentially existed to justify why Chaos Marines don't have access to space marine war gear that has been around since the Horus Heresy. And, like I said, it's also AstroTurf. And then, um, as far as that goes, lore channels, and this includes mine, you, should, you shouldn't put all your eggs in one basket and believe that everything I say is totally correct or everything, although I do my absolute best to research everything. Lore channels, uh, they're not as good as hobby channels because that vast majority of them don't play tabletop, never played the tabletop, often don't even, like, many of them I've seen don't even play the RPGs, and such, they don't care about the metagame like the hobby channels might, where the hobby channels can, t like, give you some hints as to why there's changes being made in lore and canon and everything else. Lore channels, mostly, for, like, just, are mostly on YouTube are an absolute travesty. 
be, uh, when it comes to 40k because I, many of them are either like general lore channels that aren't specialized in 40k that they might have good content they might have bad but the majority of the time you've only heard about them because they're popular and therefore they're more popular be and they got popular in the first place because of good presentation not because they cite their sources and then you have you have essentially uh, syndicated channels like Arch Warhammer where they're popular not on their own merits, not because they cite their sources, not because they even present things well, but because their fan base is uh, their fan base is interlinked with the fan bases of other YouTubers that have nothing to do with 40k lore, and they are part of a larger YouTube syndicate that you may or may not be aware of, uh, and the larger new YouTube network for their ad for their ad revenue that you may or may not be aware of that uh, like helps push them to the front point being is that like and and then aside point being with that one is that they're also not there meritoriously and then aside from those kinds of channels you have ones that are just god awful in my opinion like uh the one mind syndicate where the vast majority of their lore is literally them reading verbatim from the from like any of the wiki pages and that's not good and i'll like that's not good for a number of reasons and i'll get into that when i talk about wikis but like not only is that lazy, not only is that uncreative, and not only is that functionally just, you're, you're, you're like, you might as well run things through a text-to-speech device, and then you're still collecting money on it, which I believe might be somewhat illegal. Uh, it's just poor form. Like, it's, you, you can at least, like, put, you can at least try to have uh, relevant artwork in some places, and then try to cite some of the, some of the artwork itself, and instead they don't even. And then, after that, as far as YouTube channels go, is uh, is any of the lore channels that are mostly there for uh, for video games, comics, or the RPGs, and same reason as before, where they're with the first variety of lore channels, as I said, is that generally if they're not specialized in 40k, they're going to come from. They might have a, a good perspective to come because they're coming from an outside, uh, like an, it's an outsider perspective initially. But they also will like miss a lot of the context, and 40k is, just has so much so much just stuff like it's just been around for so long i mean with all these additions over 30 years of canon and everything at this point that like when they lack that level of context it can lead to some major issues and it's especially grating when the majority of their canon comes from you know this tier four of well they're going to talk about the lore of the bolter or something like that and they've only ever seen the bolter in like uh you know dawn of war which that's already it's it's already like you know very petty to argue about that obviously because it's just a, it's a, just a gun but like the portrayal like just for an example the portrayal of even weapons and war gear in 40k has not even been static across video games in even the same series like none of the weapons have operated the same way in any of the three dawn of war games they've been changed every single time sometimes even they've changed in between expansions and uh that it definitely applies when it's different games made by different developers or different comics by different writers that are third party and and whatnot and um that's that's pretty much like the the main issue with it though like i said as an outsider they can offer some refreshing perspective but just be prepared for them to not really get the 40k fan base and then they'll say some things that might be controversial and instead of having a discussion about it, their entire comment section is filled with assholes yelling heresy, or uh, people trying to have like you know anime like anime slash comic nerd tier uh, power level discussions about how you know Space Marine power armor is better than Imperial Stormtrooper power armor in every way possible, and yada yada yada. No one cares. In addition to stuff, no one cares about blogs. Uh, there's a lot of blogs that are just kind of awful um, about 40k lore and there's some that are really good but the majority of the ones that are really good are honestly just there because they're like they're book review blogs um, and some of, some of them are book review blogs that also do review of the content of the rest of the game itself and they are very much um, they they can they can offer a valuable perspective though many of them are tainted by modernity obviously because you know, it's very rare to find old blogs still run by people that have played 40k forever and and haven't embraced every single change. 
Uh, and that's that's the main issue is that like I, I if, if anything a message I should get across to you and this is obviously still my opinion to so take it with a grain of salt is that forward momentum with 40k like any continual changes to the canon are usually done in bad faith and you should be immediately wary of them and the people that have actively just given up and are saying oh look it's a new thing I'm going to embrace it because it's new you should not care about what they have to say because the vast majority of the time they just want new shiny things and they're not actually interested in what made the game good in the first place, what made it something you liked and m more often than not, especially in the modern day, these new shiny things are actively a detriment to the rest of the fandom and the rest of the canon and the rest of like everything that was good about the game. Um, very, like, and, and a special note, dedicated tumblers I'm, I'm just going to flat out say this you can, you can disregard this because it's my opinion or whatever, but Dedicated 40k tumblers are not to be trusted. Dedicated tumblers to anything in general are not to be trusted. Ever. I don't care if they look really cool and they cite their artwork and everything else. It's still Tumblr. Never go there. Uh, then there's wikis. Which, this is a doozy. Because the four big ones that associate with 40k are uh, Lexicanum, which is not really to be trusted because Lexicanum is moderated and edited by Games Workshop staff. And a funny note here is that there's a side Lexicanum, it's also called Lexicanum, operated for War Machine. So that should tell you something about, like, how these people operate. They have deleted entire articles. They, like, they'll cite things if it's within the last three editions. And everything else prior to that, they'll remove citations. And then uh, pretend they don't exist. They refuse to cite their own artists. They often memory hole members of GW's staff that are no longer with them. And they memory whole entire articles. They'll delete entire articles. They'll delete whole sections of articles on pages. They'll remove portals. All kinds of stuff like, like just dead links and everything on anything that contradicts what the current canon is. And they, will never, they won't even tell you that it contradicts the current canon. There's many pages and articles that do tell you that there's canon contradictions and will still have it there. But I think that's just by virtue of the fact that like the wiki's been around a long time. And, like I said, 40k is so huge that there's going to be, like, if anybody ever wrote anything on that page about anything, you're going to have a lot of, uh, you're going to have, like, a lot of overlap. 40k Wiki is the next big one after that, and it has many of the same problems as Lexicanum, but it's not run by official editors, so there's a lot of times where there's articles that'll have contradicting canon on them, an old canon and a new canon that kind of sort of contradicts, that won't be removed at all either out of sheer laziness or because uh, the editors at 40k wiki as far as I've seen seem to be interested in having as much content as possible not having the right content though they are very like they, they whenever new canon is added they jump on that shit immediately and uh, because of that like a lot of it is associated with fan canon which I have to get into um, 1d4chan is a big one is is like the third biggest wiki you'll find about that and 1d4chan is not really to be trusted anymore or like even back when it was it was really good i would argue is you couldn't really trust it because they would actively ignore in lore explanations for things just because they would find uh, their own interpretation funnier as you do with old chans i mean 1d4chan is like 1d4chan is like the fat nerd equivalent of encyclopedia dramatica it's like, you know, there's plenty of information on there that's hilarious, and there's plenty of, uh, like, there's plenty of articles on there that are uh, entertaining to read, but, you know, they're, they are, will lie to tell a joke. They will lie because it's funny, and they will lie because they have an agenda. They won't, like, they, they're not interested in truth and veracity over there. And any of the articles that ever were true or, or, or like, verifiable on a lot of things, even stuff like, you know, the Eye of Terror campaign, uh, a lot of those, a lot of their own fan canon stuff has been edited out, and that's because not only was the, is like there's been internecine warfare between different varieties of channers since 2015 and Gamergate and all of that, which is its own whole thing, and I should not talk about it, and please don't ask me to. Like, in addition to just how like batshit all of that has gotten, a big problem with 1D4chan is this next wiki, TV Tropes, which TV Tropes hasn't had an obsession with 40k for a while, especially because they... Uh, TV Tropes is basically a loose conglomeration of fanfiction writers that have built a wiki out of 
codifying every single possible writing device anyone's ever used in any writing ever. And as a result, they think that they are the arbitrators on of it on the internet because there's no there, there's nowhere else as expansive or as um, I suppose um, iconic. And the problem is, though, is that like the vast majority of uh, they they have exfiltrated their site and have many people that are originally TV tropes like from TV tropes tropers have gone to other sites and started writing and posting and editing everything there the same way. And one of these sites was 1D4chan, where a lot of the new articles, regardless of intent, regardless of modern uh, canon conflicts, regardless of if people are like pro-new crons or old crons or some conflict like that, many of the articles had been deleted and rewritten in the style of TV tropes. And like you can see this by like the mass inclusion of quotes that have nothing to do with 40K that just seem like they fit. Um references, verbatim trope names a lot of the time. Like, TV tropes can be considered a source of information on 40k lore because they have exhaustively, like the site itself, if you consider it a single entity, has exhaustively read almost every 40k book ever written. That said, like, their own writing style is very formulaic. They try to deliberately be inoffensive, which is stupid because 40k is about the grim darkness of the far future where there's only war, death camps, slavery, misery, communism, uh, space demons, uh, space aliens that are also demons, and space aliens that are trying to fight demons because they don't want demons to ever make anything good ever again, because that's also a thing that could happen. It's like, demons make things bad, but they also make things good, so we have to kill them either way. Because reasons. Either like, the, the main thing here is... Uh, main thing here is that because 40k is inherently an offensive setting TV tropes and tropers in general fall in line with the same mindset as modern GW as far as like for all intents and purposes they're functionally the same because they are trying to whitewash the product and while the, the corporate bootlicks are trying to whitewash the product because they want it to be sold to even more children tropers will do the exact same thing because they are they are afraid of offensive content, and even though they'll say otherwise, they have tons of tropes and trope pages on offensive content and everything. Their own philosophy on their site has always been: let's not do reviews, let's be very careful about our opinions, and let's always sit there and pretend that you know everybody has a valid, like everybody has valid input to this. Even though we will, like, if we think your input is invalid for any reason. We will ignore our own philosophy on that and delete everything we do. So, this leads into the fan canon, which fan canon, a lot of it came out of 1D4chan and old TG from when 4chan was just 4chan. And it wasn't, there wasn't 8chan and 8coon and, and 4chan that's basically just Reddit with Anonymous and Reddit was allowed opinions on the internet and all the terrible things that have happened since, you know, 2007 and, and 2015, even worse. But... There's, um, I can, I can, I put this in here because there's a certain type of site that has a lot of information on 40k or tries to portray itself as having a lot of information on 40k that I call a shill site. And there's old forms like Spiky Bits and Daka Daka and Bolter and Chainsword and everything that are very specialized, and some of them are like that. But the prime example of a shill site are places like Bell of Lost Souls, where they are there. As a, they're there as a tabletop gaming news outlet, and they don't always just do 40k, but they functionally exist to shill the latest product that GW turns out with to you, and anytime they do opinion pieces on lore or anything else, the writers that they get from their own forums to do that are often very much ideologically biased, and will functionally just sit there and talk down to you about how your interpretations of canon are wrong, and you should go back to your mother's basement, or something like that. I have done videos of this in the past where, like, on the, uh, like, on the stupid shit that they say, on the stupid people that they bring on who talk tremendous amounts of shit and actively make the game and the community worse, despite the fact that they're trying to sit there, they, they exist to do that, and, uh, or exist to try and make it better and try to increase the number of people in it, and all they do is turn more people away or, or bring in bad people that, to the canon that don't aren't actually interested in 40k and are just there because it's popular in their in their own groups. 
And uh, as a result, like, once again, my opinion, take it with a bag of salt or two. Don't ever go to Bell of Lost Souls unless you're there to make fun of them. Don't do it. We, they are the ones who put out, who, who gave a platform to feminism in 40K, which was all to everybody's detriment. Everybody was harmed in the making of that video. Um, they were the ones that did, uh, that, that put on many of the articles from years back when they were uh, essentially mitigating the fallout of Age of Sigmar. There were many of the people that platformed everybody that were trying to get rid of uh, Slanesh. And I know that I'm saying platform like I'm some SJW or something, but that's functionally what they did. They, Their site management and site editors said, we're not doing this, we're just providing a platform, and every single viewpoint that they allowed on, to, on their front page for their 40k articles already aligned with viewpoints that they already had. There was no discussion, there was no debate, there was no like differences of opinion it was just people talking down to the vote like the at, i don't know if it would be a minority but like that the part of the fan base that don't like the modern changes and they were basically just sitting there saying you're wrong and stupid we need to get rid of Slanesh. we need to make female marines we need to stop making fun of the tarox design uh we need to we need to tell people that are upset about old crons that their opinions don't matter like all kinds of stuff like that and, I mean, I could do an entire series of videos on all the stupid articles that some of the writers, such as Pimpcron, came out with, and how they're just awful. Just awful. So, I would not bother with Bella Lost Souls ever, or any site similar to it, which Spiky Bits is slowly becoming, unfortunately. And, um, I had Daka Daka and, and like, older forums that were of similar lines from, like, that have been around for years and years. They're so old now that I can't even dive into them and really give you a read on it without, like, doing research for months and months and years and years. But, uh, I would, I would go there and lurk if you wanted to gain any information on them, and then other than that, not really associate with those places, because the vast majority of the time, it, it seems that, uh, 40K's grognards are have been essentially like are, are being removed from many communities and uh, those of that remain that are part of like the old guard that have played around for a long time are the kind of people that just want new shiny toys for their space marine chapter and don't care about the game being ruined in the process many of them didn't notice that uh the terrible power creep that went on the reaction to Night Titans in particular uh, from years ago is a good indicator of this, where nobody sat there and said, wait, aren't we escalating the game out of control by adding flyers and fortifications and all of this in regular skirmish mode games and not Apocalypse or something else? And most of those people were shouted down and said, no, but my giant Night Titan, it's so cool. Even though every single time any of those were, in were introduced... Like, all of those models were introduced and everything, they essentially broke the game around them and ruined the metagame for anybody who didn't have the money to buy their own Night Titan. Especially not if they were playing a faction that couldn't buy a Night Titan. So, there's that. Um, and then finally, I should note, negative one. The negative one tier of canon, the most powerful point of canon. Whatever the Game Master declares and the group consensus is, because... Uh, the vast majority of my viewer base and the people that help me with this with this channel are people that are not interested actually in the 40k tabletop game itself beyond understanding the root cause and changes of everything else in 40k and are actually mostly people that play the RPGs. And the RPGs, though the Fantasy Flight games ones are defunct, nobody plays Wrath and Glory and uh, nobody can get a fi can find a, a copy of Inquisitor to save their life anymore still are important uh, it's still important to, uh, to note uh, how the rest of the canon affects them whenever new content was added or if anybody homebrewing anything. But as far as all of that goes, the most important canon is whatever the Game Master declares is canon for their, for their campaign and what the group, the group consents to beyond that or vice versa. And uh, that's really what's important. So if you're going to run a Rogue Trader game and say that like it takes place during 8th edition, the Sycadrix Maledictum is there and everyone's got to deal with the giant space vagina that does nothing, and Plague Marines are back and worse looking than ever, and the tower full retard now and all that stuff. If everybody's cool with it and you're still having a fun time, then it doesn't matter. You're not affecting the rest of the world with it. It's, you're not doing a bad thing. If you care, go with my blessing, what have you. 
but it's this is important to know because this is the most important that, like other than rule zero of everybody should be having fun this is the most important thing about any 40k rpg you can ever know and it overrides all of this other canon if you care about it and if people show up in your game and start arguing about what is and isn't canon and saying that like oh well iron warriors can't have mark six corvus pattern helmets or something like really dumb rules lawyer arguments like that then i ref then just refer to this so that's about everything if anybody has any more questions for me or wants to call me a douchebag uh comments are right there uh i just uh let me know if you think i missed anything mostly that's what i'm worried about but as far as the rest of this goes um i can put up this mind map I can put up this mind map publicly if anybody wants to add notes to it. Just let me know in the comments. Um, and, like, I guess I'll add, like, 8th edition and everything else. I really don't want to. I really don't want to talk about 8th edition. But uh, I, I try to avoid it as much as possible. But that's... That's canon. So, yeah, this is what's canon. And especially, I should note, I probably should have said this earlier, but anytime you bring up quotes where people say, everything is canon, but not everything is true or yada yada, remember that everybody who has referred to the canon in those terms that have become iconic quotes left GW like nearly, like in one case over a decade ago and another case nearly a decade ago. Like of the, of the quotes I can think of off the top of my head, especially everything, everything is canon but not everything is true. The guy who said that GW never said that he was, he was right. Like the, the rest of the corporation never said that he was right and he left the company like 10 years ago. So, you know, when you, when, if you're trying to argue that and say it can be anything or whatever, just remember that GW, if, if something that you like is canon and it, it isn't something that can be easily sold to children, GW will not hesitate in making it non-canon and then telling the rest of the fan base to basically like pretend that you and everything you like never existed. They did this with squats way back when they did this with the Slon. They did it with the vast majority of first and second edition, and that may be seen that may seem a long time ago, but I mean, if you want a modern example, look at what they've done to the crew. Look what they did to the crew with the Tau. Look at what they did to the Tau themselves. Look at how like out of control everything about the Eldar has become, and how they're suddenly center stage in the in the setting and everything. Look at uh, all the stuff that happened with War of the Beast. Look at the retcons that happened entirely, like, self-contained within the Horus Heresy, within a few books of one another. The very first... A good example of this. The very first book of the Horus Heresy was written during the time when GW didn't have a stance on how long Space Marines lived for, and Dan Abnett li literally said in the narration verbatim that Space Marines uh, were biologically immortal. And then, by the modern age of the Horus Heresy, like, literally within... Ten, like uh, nine or ten books after that, like a few, a handful of years, GW suddenly had a hard stance on how long Space Marines live based on canon from the codexes that Matt Ward came up with, and everybody just went along with. So, like I said, everything, m myself, Black Library, everything else, grain of salt. That's canon. 